Welcome to episode 132 of the How Did It Happen podcast hosted by Mike Malatesta. In this episode, Mike welcomes Philip Pfeiffer, the founder of Experience Traction, where he works with entrepreneurs and leadership teams of companies to experience three things he calls vision, traction, and healthy. Hey, Philip, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure, really, and I uh, I owe a debt of gratitude once again to Justin Breen for connecting me with with Philip. We had uh, a really great conversation a couple of weeks ago um, to get to know one another, and he graciously accepted my invitation to come on the podcast today, and we're going to learn a lot from him, and let's get started. Philip, I start every one of my shows the same way. It's with a simple question. How did it happen for you? Yeah, I love it, Mike. It's interesting because uh, you asked me that you said you were going to ask me that question. It's been a couple of months now. And when you introduced me to that question, I had an immediate answer. And I, and that's the way I'm going to answer now. But it's funny because I've had a couple of months to second guess myself and think about fine tuning and refining that answer. Uh, but I'm going to stick with uh, I'm going to stick with the answer I came up with. And, and the way it happened to me, as, as strange as it may sound, is in the mid 90s, I read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And that book had a profound impact on my life and uh, in, in ways that I didn't know at the time, but I immediately loved it. And the reason I loved it was because it is a system and a model. And so it has real utility because it's, it's describing, you know, it almost describes a, a perspective on an outlook on the world and, and, a, and, a, and a tool and a system that you can use for, that, for, for the world. And, and I just immediately fell in love with it. And, you know, jumping to, jumping to now, uh, jumping to today, I, I, I found some other systems and tools that have real utility. Uh, and, and that's what, you know, that's, I, 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 that's what I love and, and that's what I do today. And that's what I teach my clients. And so, but that looking back on it, that's, that's where it started. You know, so I hear that book talked about a lot. <clears throat> I've read the book years ago. You read it years ago. You've probably read it since, but what, <clears throat> what do you remember about the book or what stayed with you so much maybe in a more specific way than, you know, a system and model for the world, which is pretty powerful to begin with. But what was it that, you know, I don't know what age you were at that time, but what was it that at the age you were, at the time in your life, at the place you were, or whatever, the convergence of these things came together and and had this kind of impact on you? Because I'm really curious about, you know, that that the whole notion of that for people, like, you know, when you're ready for the message, the message comes or that kind of thing. And it sounded like that, I call that a convergence. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but. Well, I love that concept of convergence and I'm sure it will come up many times in the next hour. There's a lot of things I took from that book, but one of them was that, you know, the, one of the key ideas is that it starts from the inside and out. So what you want to do, what you want to achieve, it all starts first uh, with some reflection and discovery about, you know, who you are and, and what you want to do. And then you take that to the outside world. And so that's, that's one aspect, a very specific aspect of it was, you know, one of the seven habits is listen first with the intent to comprehend. And you could build a lifetime of mastery around just that one habit. Um, and, you know, uh, when I work with my clients, for example, uh, sometimes some of the questions I ask, it's the first time they're listening to each other answer those questions. And it's really profound. It's a profound moment. And um, so, you know, there's something, you know, that's specifically that. And, and there's another concept in there. One of the seven habits is sharpen the saw. And, uh, and, and I just love that. And I'm sure that's familiar to a lot of people too. Yeah. So that goes back to like George Washington with the ax, right? You gotta, or at least it's attributed to him. So the, 
that's really uh, so I love what what you what you shared there. Listen with the intention to understand, or something along those lines. I was at a meeting last week, and one of the quotes that was up on the board was from. This was a Vistage meeting, and one of the quotes up on the board was from a speaker who had spoken to us at some point in the past, and it said something like this: um, "Are you listening to me to understand, or are you listening?" to me to prove that you're right or something like that. So like the whole, right. Yeah. It's a whole difference between someone who's actively engaged in listening to another person and a person who's listening because they haven't found an opportunity to jump back in and tell you what, you know, they think or what you should be thinking or whatever. It just kind of connected for me there. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, yeah. Some people listen with the intent to respond. And they've got their response ready and they're not listening. And there's a way to listen with your whole body. There's a way to listen, not just for the words someone is saying, but for their body language, their tone of voice. And it's amazing if you stop talking and you lean back and you really listen and you listen with your eyes. Sometimes people are telling you stuff and you're just not, you're not hearing it. And, and, and that's another thing that happens with my clients a lot. You know, I'll join a, I work with the leadership teams of companies and I'll sit in with them and uh, I'll see, you know, the, somebody on the team will be really communicating the message loud and clear that they don't want to be there, that they're not bought in, that they're not happy. And, uh, and there's a lot of ways to say that without actually saying it. In fact, you can say one thing and, and really mean something else. And so sometimes just by listening, we can, we can pick up on some, some pretty, a lot, uh, you know, some clear messages. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, arms folded, you know, that kind of legs crossed in front of you, that kind of thing. I'll bet there's, a, yeah, there's a ton of stuff you learn watching people. So you, as I understand it, you um, you live in Los Angeles area now. You've spent time in New York, it looks like, as well. You went to school in, at, at NYU. Can you give us, I guess what I'm interested in learning about as a contextualization for the rest of our discussion is, you know, not just where you grew up, but what, what were you thinking, whether it was in high school or whether it was in college about, or before that even, about what you would become and what the world was like for you, maybe before you read Stephen Covey's book? Yeah, well, I, well, I grew up on a horse ranch outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, and it was very, you know, Tom Sawyer type of a situation. I could go out the back of my house and walk for miles in the wilderness, uh, pastures, fields, forest streams kind of thing. We had horses and motorcycles, and that's where I grew up. And, um, and of course, I wanted to get out of there and go to a big city. And as soon as I could, I went to New York City. So that kind of, it, 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 but I've, got, I've always appreciated nature. Um, you know, I, I, looking back on it, I've always been a coach and I just didn't know it. Um, and the first, the first, uh, the first time that became aware was my parents got, uh, got divorced when I was really young. I was eight years old and I was a middle child and I kind of was the one that kept everything together. Um, and they, I, they, they called, my family calls me the secretary of state of the family. <laughs> And that started from eight years old during a divorce. And it's just who I am. I am a, I'm a team builder. I keep, I keep teams together. I keep people together. That's what, that's where I get my joy. That's what I'm, that's what I'm passionate about. That's what I'm great at. And it, and it, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was clear from an early age. And so you get, so was going to college in New York, that was your first, uh, opportunity to, to go there that's you said you wanted to get it get it into the big city yeah you know growing up in little rock arkansas was great until i turned about 14 years old and then i wanted to uh, you know i was out in the country and you know frankly i wanted to be around my friends i wanted to be around girls and and uh, my my family my, my dad had taken me to new york when i was younger and so i just was amazed by the city and that's that's the only place i wanted to go Hmm. Okay, and so you got there, and did it live up to its the dream that you had of it? Because, I, and I only ask because for me, it's it's like I get there, and it's like 
you know, it's just overwhelming and cool. And then it's overwhelming and, eh, you know, I, yeah. it kind of wears off for me, but, it's, but I'm just one person. That happened to me too. I mean, uh, at the time there was, that was the only place I wanted to go and I went there and, uh, and, and that's how I met, uh, the co-founder of my first company. And so it was a great thing that it that happened. Uh, I, I met Andy Stewart and, and together with another couple of people, we, we started a company called enature.com. But, but, um, now I live in, you know, I've, I've also lived in London and I live in Los Angeles and, but now that I'm older and have a family, I've got, I've got my eyes on maybe a smaller place in the world at some point down the road. So I'll, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to live in a place like New York City, and uh, and it's fun and it's exciting, but it's also tough living. So you mentioned the e nature, and I think um, I think I saw somewhere, maybe on your website or or somewhere else, that you're this blew me away. Fifth generation uh, entrepreneurial family. You're the you've got a yeah. you've got a five generation thing going. Can you, which I feel like that's really unusual. <laughs> so what's that all about? Well, so, so my, so I was named after my great, great grandfather, Philip Pfeiffer, and he came to this country in 1849 from Germany. And the guy, uh, you know, he came, came through Ellis Island, just like everybody else, right? Landed in New York. And he found his way to Little Rock, Arkansas, which just blows my my mind that you would come all the way from Germany to New York and keep going west <laughs> and find your way to Little Rock, Arkansas. But he grew up on the Necker River in Germany, and he was fascinated by rivers. And so the Mississippi, he took the Mississippi down, and then he took the Arkansas River up to Little Rock, and he started a shop along the Arkansas river selling things to, to the, you know, the, the people on boats that were trafficking and trading on the river. And, um, that store, his son, Eugene Pfeiffer, who's my great grandfather, that store became mechanics lumber company, which was, a, was to his home improvement stores and a lumber company. And, and, uh, that was passed down to his son and my dad. And, um, my dad, the, the current incarnation of that company is a real estate development company uh, that is uh, that is still in operation. My dad is still running it. My brother and me and my sister are on the board of advisors. And mm. yeah, it's been a it's been a hundred and what is that? 180, 180 years, some lot of history there. Wow, that's so. And, and as far as you know, your great grandfather came here not knowing at all where he would end up. There was no, he wasn't headed to a family member or was he? Yeah, that's right. He, he did not know where he was. He did not know where he was going. He went through um, Louisville, Kentucky and learned some, some aspects of running a business uh, from a gentleman there. And then he kind of took that with him down the Mississippi and then up the Arkansas River to Little Rock. And, um, and he started a family. He, he had eight kids. And so if you go to Little Rock, Arkansas today, um, there's, a, there's a huge family tree and there's a lots of different descendants of him uh, in Little Rock. He's mm -hmm. very well known. Um, he, he, and he did a lot of great things. He, started, he helped start the school district. Um, he was Jewish and, and he was one of the founding members of the, of the temple in Little Rock. It was pretty interesting, re really quite interesting, uh, man and really created a legacy. I got a lot of respect uh, for that, of course. So do you mind if I ask you a couple of quite more questions about that? Um, cause I know that, um, you mentioned that you and your sisters and maybe some others are on the board of directors, um, my experience with multi-generational companies is that um, they're impressive because it's hard to keep it all together, but they're also complex because, you know, when you have sons and daughters and they have sons and daughters and they have sons and daughters, it can become um, complex. And I'm just wondering how you and your family have 
sort of navigated your way um, through that. And interestingly, uh, um, I'm assuming those of you on the board aren't don't participate uh, in the company on an on a on a operating basis. So you're kind of in a way kind of observers, even though the board's I guess technically in charge. How can you? Can, yeah, what's your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, the board shouldn't be in charge, and, and the board should be observing, and that is what we do. And it, it's very complex, especially now that um, my brother and sister and I, none of us live in Little Rock. We're, we're, mm. My brother's in Vancouver. My sister is in Virginia outside of Washington, D.C., and, of course, I'm in Los Angeles. Um, but I think that my family's gotten pretty good at dealing with complexity and trying to keep things simple and structured and organized. Um, uh, but my, my dad runs the day to day operations of that business, It's a small business, and we are in the process of figuring out what that succession plan looks like. And it's incredibly difficult, uh, uh, you know, given the fact that none of us reside in Little Rock anymore. Right. Yeah. I can just imagine there's a whole ton of issues that have to be that have to be addressed at least. Yeah. I see it as a very com complex, complex thing, but I'm, but I also, it's just, it's also kind of like the, the coolest thing that you could have is something that's lasted that long and stayed in a family. I just, there's just something really special sounding about it. At least I'm sure it's I'm sure it's, <laughs> I'm sure it's not all like peaches and cream or anything, but, um, yeah. Yeah. No. There's been some. There was some. There were some major pivots to that business at every step of the way. Um, expansions and downsizing and uh, um, and you know refocusing and um, and you know it's it's uh, you know with 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 all of us kids moving outside of Little Rock, it might be the end of the, of that legacy. I mean, who knows? You know, uh, we 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 may you know it, or the legacy will continue under different names in different in different cities. I don't know. It's interesting. What about um, your? Sounds like you're still close with your dad. You're close with your mother as well after the divorce. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Kept in touch, you know, you know, Secretary of State of the family. So yeah. I've got great relationships with everybody. <laughs> I love it. Good for you. It's it's uh it's great when that's able to be the the outcome of something like that because it's so often it's not. So congratulations on Mr. Secretary of State for taking care of that. So e nature, you and your friends started that. Was that something that you started? Um, at NYU, or was it something that happened after that? Tell, what what was it? And what it? Yeah, it was it was after NYU. Um, I met uh, Andy Stewart, and really, I, I I always tell people I I kind of I just lucked out. I mean, I just fell uh, ass backwards into it. Really, um, you know, Andy Stewart held the publishing rights for the National Audubon Society Field Guide. And we digitized that content and put it online. This was in the late '90s, so the you know the internet had happened. Netscape IPO'd in '95, and uh, and um, you know I, I went into college in '93 without an email address and came out in '97, graduated and had an email address and a GeoCities, you know, I had a Yahoo email address and a GeoCities account. If you remember that and. And so, but in any event, we digitized that content and put it up online. And it was a portal, you know, that's what we called them back then, portal for, for destination for uh, wildlife enthusiasts and nature enthusiasts. And if you remember the National Audubon Society field guides, you could, you know, you could, you could take them out into the field and, 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 you know, bird watchers, for example, were the most passionate group and they could identify birds and, uh, but there were, you know, field guides for everything, mammals and plants and the night sky. And so we took all that content, made it searchable, created a community, uh, community site. And, uh, and we, we built that company up over about four years and then sold it to the National Wildlife Federation. And is it still in existence? 
Um, not in its original form, no. Okay. How did you get the idea? Did Andy have the idea and you had the, how did, what was, the, you know, you said he, I don't know, how did you guys, how, yeah. It's, it was, uh, I, the com. it was funny because the conversation, he, he, he had the idea, he found the financing. I mean, he really put everything together. And I, I said to him, he should put it online and make a website. And he said, well, I'm thinking about him doing it. And I was, I, you know, what I like to say, I was really young and I, and, you know, I was a coach before I knew I was a coach and before I had an experience or authority to be a coach. And so when I look back on my past, I have these little, these little funny little odd coaching moments where I'm talking to people that have a lot more seniority and a lot more years than me. And, and so I was saying, you know, you, we got to do this. And, you know, he, Andy is 30, 40 years, my senior. And, and um, he said, well, we, you know, and thinking about it and going to do it. And so, so I was just right there at the right time and, um, you know, became a kind of a jack of all trades inside the company. We brought in a lot more expertise than what I had um, at the founding level, you know, and um, including an, a, an angel investor and um, a digital, a digital team that was able to, to actually get it executed and get it done and launched. Um, it was a cool, it was just really cool. I, I, I never knew what I wanted to do. And when I went into college, I discovered that the internet was happening and I got really excited and I, I just knew that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be doing something there. And this opportunity presented it, presented it to, to, to me. And so I just, I took it and ran with it. And you mentioned sort of quickly there, and I may have missed it earlier, but that Andy was 30 or 40 years older than you. Um, normally, you don't just run into people that you end up partnering with who are that much older than uh, you. So how did you meet him and how did you end up having a, you know, I guess knowing each other well enough to say, hey, let's partner in business? Yeah. Well, he ran a um, he ran a publishing company in New York, and he was introduced to me um, through uh, he was the root he he was introduced to me through one of my cousins. They were roommates in college. Ah, okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so so Philip, you you build up this company, you sell it, and did you know what was what was next? I guess. So I want to ask you that, but then uh, you also said something interesting, and, and you've said it a couple times about knowing you be knowing that you're a coach, and you sort of talked about knowing you're a coach, you know, and having to overcome like being a coach to older people, or maybe not knowing everything about being a coach. So. First question is, what what were you thinking when you got out of the business? And then I want to get back to the coaching thing, because I don't want to let that go, because a lot of people, I even think, I've had a ton of experience, but then I think to myself, well, if I'm going to coach somebody, what would I, what would, you know, how am I qualified to do that? And what would I do? And why would it be valuable? Yeah, well, it's, I, well, you know, the way I think about it, really, I should say that I didn't know I was a coach, hmm. but I was. And, and that's, and the realization, it took me, it took me just getting older and getting more experience and, and to, to have that realization of what I am. And, 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 the, and that's been a really, that's been a really pre profound discovery in, in, you know, my later life. Uh, but after E Nature, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I was, uh, I, I did some traveling with my girlfriend at the time and moved to Los Angeles and, uh, got involved, you know, at that time, someone showed me, uh, ringtones on a, you know, on a cell phone, ringtones and wallpaper. If you remember the early two thousands before, you know, when there were feature phones before the smartphones. And so I got involved in mobile very early because it was, to me, it was the internet on phones and I was really excited. And we can talk about that a little bit if you want. I mean, I was, it was too early to do anything interesting. And I was involved with a bunch of different startups that, um, 
you know, we preceded Apple and Google into the mobile space, preceded the iPhone. I mean, I was doing mobile five years before Apple got into it. And so, um, but I think the more interesting thing probably for your viewers is, is the coaching thing, because, you know, that's what I do today. That's where my expertise is. I mean, I consider myself, yes, I've got some entrepreneurial experience, um, but there's always people that have a lot more entrepreneurial experience than I have. And what it, you know, the discovery for me is that I've, you know, I was, I, I'm a coach. That's where I draw my power and my energy. That's what I'm great at, what I love to do. And, but I was, there's a lot of instances, like what I said before, where I was exhibiting some of that coaching before I had the voice or the authority really, you know? So on the mobile, was that, um, was Infospace one of the, one of the companies that you were working with on, on that or was that yeah, I worked for Infospace, so that wasn't one of my companies. I was okay. an employee right. in that business. Right. Um, and uh, and uh, I, But what was interesting about Infospace is it was a big Seattle-based uh, technology company, and, and but we had, you know, there was this mobile studio down in Los Angeles with mobile content, and we were providing that content to the carriers. You know the carriers were the big were the big operators in that space at that time, Verizon and AT and T, and we. Um, so I was part of that team that was um, that was building mobile applications and games on those feature phones, J Two and Me and Brew. For any of those out there that remember those days, and yeah, I was doing that. It was I. I it was just very coincidental, but um, I'm recording a podcast this afternoon with uh, Naveen Jain, who the founder of Infospace. So I don't know if you know him or, you know, I just thought, Oh, wow. That's a really, that's, yeah. you know, what a coincidence. I <laughs> saw. So. Well, it's, that is a, that's a great coincidence. I mean, I was there uh, towards the end and I was there when we, we, they had to shut down Infospace in Los Angeles because we, we lost the last operator deal we had, which was the, I believe it was the AT&T deal. This is 15, over you know 15 years ago i think something like that but uh but it was uh that was the end of of that part of info space wow okay so it wasn't it wasn't your fault right because i'm going to ask him if it was your fault <laughs> he won't know me and it wasn't my fault that's right <laughs> <laughs> okay all right um so let's get into coaching because you've you've had well, you said you've been a coach, you know, for, forever. So I guess I, I guess I, I really want to explore what that means, like specifically what that means, Philip. And then you've had different um, companies you've started, coaching companies that you've started, and then, and you're. I assume that some of them have had, like your Fight for Sales Academy, probably had something, you know, that I don't know about that you were coaching, and then, you know, now your your experience traction. I, I I know what that is, you know, a little bit, but I don't, you know, I, I so I'm just curious about your evolution as a, as a coach, because I think it's, it's, I just think it's so interesting to be able to use your experience and your talents in a way that helps so many other people as a, as a coach. And I'm also interested in so many people call themselves a coach these days that I, I, I guess I want to understand what, from your perspective, what that really means, what it means to you? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, uh, Mike. I mean, I think that um, a great coach teaches tools or systems or, or, or models, but I, I like to, I like to keep things simple. And if you think about it, just, they teach, they teach how to use tools and how to implement those tools. And that's one aspect of powerful coaching. And, and um, you know, the reason, the reason I answered this question, how did it happen for me? Well, I read, I read the seven habits of highly fetched people. Well, that was tools. That was a system and a model. And it was very exciting because once I learned that I became more powerful and I became, uh, you know, I, because I could apply it over and over and over again in many different instances. Hmm. And to me, that's a big part of coaching. It's, um, it's, uh, um, it's not this ad hoc it's not all, it's not entirely this kind of ad hoc sort of listening, counseling, um, advising business. There's a little piece of some of that 
But if you can teach someone a tool and how to implement that tool and how to get, you know, how to get going down the path of mastery towards that tool, and if you can teach them how to teach it to their people, then all of a sudden that's very powerful. And you can coach tools and processes. You can coach, you can coach um, people on the use of, of the tools and the understanding of the tools and the application of the tools. And so to me, that's, that's, what, that's what's powerful about a real coach. And so when you when you left e nature and then you started on these other things, when was it that you know you had various jobs, you had various other startups that you got involved in or founded? What what was it that finally tripped you, and or what was the trigger, or what was the convergence of events that made you think, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna commit myself to. This is my unique ability or whatever, and I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I love that question. Um, I, you know, about two years ago, I was uh, sitting at lunch. Uh, I was running Fight for Sales Academy, which is a, which is a sales and marketing company. I, I had created an operating system for the sales and marketing function of a business. And I created all, all of my own, uh, um, you know, created, created this system and this methodology and this process. And I was pitching a prospect um, and we were sitting at lunch here in Los Angeles. And at some point she said, you know what, Philip? She said, you, you should read Traction because you sound like those guys. And, um, and of course, Traction is Gino Wickman's book about the entrepreneurial operating system. And that's what I, I'm an, I'm an implementer for EOS. And I read, so I'm a big reader, and you can probably tell, I'm, I'm a big reader. That's my version of self-coaching. I'm self-taught. I mean, I went to undergrads, you know, I went to school, but uh, past school, I've just been self-taught, and it's because I just read, and I read and read and read. I love it, and I'm always looking for things, tools that I can use and apply and teach others, and when I read Traction, it was just like coming home. I mean, it, it's an operating system for a business, and um but more than that, because it also it won't just transform your business; it'll transform the way it'll transform your life, and the way you communicate, and the way you surround yourselves with people in your life, even your personal life. So, when I read it, you know, I just I implemented it in in my business. I implemented it for some existing clients, and then I said, "This is what I want to do," and that was the realization that. I was not an entrepreneur first and foremost. You know, I was a very, I had a very specialized skill set that, um, and 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 that and that is as a coach. And so, um, you know, that was uh, that wasn't that long ago in the grand history of things. That was, uh, you know, just over two years ago. Right. And how was, so how, when you started, um, Fight for Sales Academy. And you created your own system. How did you get you? How did you get people interested in it? And I asked the question, "How did you get business?" Because I asked the question, you when you were talking about EOS, you mentioned the book Traction and having read the book. And the book, um, you know, is a, is a uh, you know, it's a great sales tool for the program because it explains the program. Um, but you. So I'm th just, and I'm thinking of some other programs like strategic coach program or like a ton of others that are out there that are very, um, they're very systematized. They're very branded. They're very, um, proven, I guess. And you, you, you know, you decided to, to sort of, I think just build your own from the ground up and I'm wondering how you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, I had this, I had this love and appreciation of systems and tools and, and, and I had people like Stephen Covey and Patrick Lencioni and Jim Collins, all of whom I had um, not just read, but done extensive R and D on. Um, and uh, obviously I had my own experience, you know, running companies, leading teams. And, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, you know, I've hired and, you know, in the past 23 years, I've hired and led about 100 employees in de various different capacities. I've generated about 50 million in revenues in various different roles. And 
so I had all that experience and I, and I had all of, you know, um, I knew who Dan Sullivan was, um, at the time and, uh, uh, just from his podcast and some things like that. So, so I, I just started, uh, I just put pen on paper and started creating, you know, what would it take to build a great, what does it take to build a great sales and marketing organization inside a company? My focus was on B2B tech because that's, that's most of my background. Um, and I just said, you know, how would you, how would you have to structure and organize? What would the processes look like? Um, you know, uh, what would, uh, all the way down, all the way down to how would you train people? Um, how would you train people on this process and what would you need? So I built it up and when I thought it was good and ready, I took it out. I tested it with some people, um, in my network and, uh, finally decided, uh, you know, I decided I could do it. I thought I could compete. I, I, I thought I could compete against some of the big players in that space. You know, Sandler is one of them, the Sandler sales. Oh, yeah, because sure. I, thought, well, I mean, I thought, you know, it was like Sandler is huge, right? It's huge. And they have all these books and everything. But really, in, in any given market, you're, you're competing against an independent contractor. And yeah, it's similar, so right? It, the implementer of Sandler, right? Sort of, yeah. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I can, if, you know, if I don't, if I don't have to compete against capital S Sandler globally. I just have to compete against individual operators. And I was like, well, I can do that. You know, <laughs> I can do that. And so, uh, and so that's how, that's how that came about. And, and I, I felt, I felt very comfortable that I could do that. And at the time, um, you know, that's, I was think I thought that's what I wanted to do. And when I discovered EOS, what I realized is there's no way I could compete against EOS and it was better and I didn't want to, I didn't want to compete against EOS. I, I wanted to, um, you know, I just, I just wanted to be a part of the, of, you know, of that community and, and I wanted to, to join a group and that's what I wanted to do. And it was a really, it's funny, you know, I'm a high quick start in Colby. If, if your listeners know what Colby is, it just means very comfortable with risk and uncertainty. And I love change, actually thrive on change. So I love to, I love to switch gears and pivot and do something different. And, and, but I had been primed for EOS my entire life. Uh, and so that's kind of why I describe it as coming home. It, it just really blew my mind. And, and you'll find that with other people that are involved in it. Um, it's kind of like, it would be like if you watch somebody build a home and, and they weren't using a, a hammer, right? They were trying to hammer nails without a hammer and you had a hammer. I mean, that's what I feel like is with EOS, you know, we all have this really simple, powerful tool. It's just really, it's just very simple and common sense and practical. And it works really, really well over and over again in lots of different instances. And so it, that's what it feels like. So for those of you listening, Colby is spelled with a K, K-O-L-B-E, I believe is, and it measures four things. So it's quick start, follow through implementer and thank you fact finder quick start fact finder follow through and implementer um, and it ranges from one to ten and none of those and it's not built to say well one is better than a ten that's not the goal the goal is what are you um, <clears throat> basically what are your strengths if so you identify what your strengths are and then the tool is made to help you choose people to work with you who complement your strengths. So, for example, I don't know what your quick start is. Mine is eight, so yours might be eight higher or below, whatever. But you don't, <clears throat> ideally, you don't want two high quick starts being the only two people on the team because a lot of stuff will get started and very little might get finished, for example. Um, Anyway, just a little bit on cold. That's a great point. And, you know, the, uh, it, you know, to your point, it's all about strengths. The opposite of the high quick start is a low quick start, and that is a strength and not a weakness. A low quick start is going to spot problems and challenges, keep you out of trouble, um, make sure it's the, you know, of all your 20 ideas that you have, not all of them are great, and they're going to make sure you don't go down too many rabbit holes with those other 18 or 19 bad ideas. So um, that's right. Yeah. So one one more question about um, the sales academy experience. What since I figure what the heck you're here. What do you what? 
how do you create a great sales organization? Well, it, it starts with people. Okay. Yeah. And that's an easy, uh, it's an easy answer, but sometimes when we forget, especially when we're down in the weeds, um, the yeah. OS gives you a really simple way to figure out what is the right people for your organization. Um, but it starts with the right people and, and, um, and you've got to have a lot of things. So, so it starts with people, but then there's a lot of, other things that you need to run a great sales organization, which don't have an awful lot to do with sales. So you need not just the right people, but they've got to be bought into your vision and how you plan to achieve that vision. And uh, in other words, you've got to have a, and you've, you've got to have a clearly defined um, business. Uh, like you've got to have a clear niche You've got to have a clear marketing strategy. So you've got to know who you're targeting and what you want to say to those people when you get them on the phone. And, um, and so you can waste a lot of time in sales by trying to train salespeople and even hire salespeople before you have all of this context in place. And you can really spin your wheels uh, and waste a lot of time and money and resources. You can bring, you know, I see it all the time. You know, people bring in these really cool marketing automation software, and um, there's all sorts of options that you can do there. You know, you, auto dialing and all of this stuff. And but if you don't have the right people and a clear vision and a clear marketing strategy uh, and some of that stuff, then 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 you you know you can you can really get into some trouble. So it sounds like really it comes down to just like every other part of the business. If you don't have a system to support the people that you're bringing in and the vision's not clear, um, the likelihood that you're going to get top performance out of your people is probably not very high. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and with sales, um, you know, you... You, all the sales in the world aren't going to help you if you've got a problem in operations and you're you're losing people out of the back of the company, not servicing them well, um, not growing word of mouth and referral. Right. So um, let me just turn to something I see on your website, and I'm going to read it because it really spoke to me as, as a as an entrepreneur, and I think it would to most, and then I'd like you to talk about it if you don't mind. So <clears throat> the quote is, somewhere along the journey, every entrepreneur eventually comes across his or her biggest obstacle, which is not some external dragon to be slayed, but is an in inner demon, a limiting belief that if overcome can transform their future. I hope to be a guide for all of my clients as they manage through this turbulence. Okay, so what do you, so I in my mind I know I I have an understanding of what I think you are talking about here, but I'd like to hear you tell us what what you're talking about there and what you've seen and how you how you deal with it. Yeah, sure. You 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 want me to go first, or do you want to share what you're what you're thinking about? Well, yeah, I'll share what I was thinking about. So. I call it the breaking point. So I, I was, it happened for me about 10 years into my first business where, um, you know, the, just the whole not knowing how to create good systems, not knowing how to, it was, it was basically, you know, my, my, it was learning on the job for me and it was, um, what it, it was, I can do everything myself and I don't need help and, Everything revolves around me and all the things I was asking for, I was getting, but all the things I was getting, I wasn't very happy getting. Um, so that's what it means to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and do you mind if I ask just like, was there, how did that manifest itself? Is there, is there something specific there you can share? Yeah. It manifested itself by a uh, convergence of three different events in 2003 which is about a decade into 
the business that made me want to quit and walk away and figure out something else to do with my life. Mm. What did you do? Well, I, I was very, very lucky. Again, convergence comes into play. So I was in a, I was in a spot where I needed help. I didn't know how to get help, but someone came along that I knew who suggested strategic coach to me, which turned out to be, which, which of course I said, I don't need that. And, you know, I, I continued to kind of grit, grit through everything for another year or so. And then I just said, okay, I submit, I got to try something. And so I, I went there thinking it wouldn't work. I joined other groups too, because I wanted to I knew that one thing I knew was that I had been too insulated. I had built, I, I call it like, like I built walls around myself or around my business because that's where I felt comfortable. And I figured I knew everything there. And so that's all I needed. And I was so totally wrong, but, it, but it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right to me that I, that to admit that. And so, um, anyway, that convergence of things got me into that program and some others at a time where, you know, had I not found those, I probably, I, I wouldn't be talking to you today. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 It's, it's that the, it's very common for an entrepreneur to, uh, to be surrounded with people that don't challenge them and um and 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 it's very common for them to be in a position where they've got to make all the decisions and all the information flows up to them and they become a bottleneck and it it's a co it's a common trajectory you know as you grow a business um to, to have that be the case. And so, so one of the things I specialize in is helping uh, entrepreneurs let go and delegate. And it's very, very difficult. It was my own personal challenge. Uh, I, I, I was not good at doing that. And I didn't, uh, I was, I was liked and loved and I was a really friendly, warm, approachable leader but I was also, I held the reins pretty tightly and, and I confused training with coaching and leadership with management. Um, and uh, um, so, so the, the, you know, that, that kind of control and that sort of not letting go is, um, you know, it can be a real saboteur to leaders. Um, it can, it can, it can, uh, it can be, it can stand in the way of growth. And, you know, um, and so to give leaders a lens, a, a new perspective on the people that they've surrounded themselves with and, and, and what they expect of those people um, is really powerful. And so, uh, because that's, you know, that's one thing that EOS will help you to do. It helps you get the right people on board so that you can delegate and elevate up into what you love to do and are great at. And you can't do that without the right people and out the right structure and without the right system. So let's, um, let's dig into delegation for a second, Philip, because I'd be interested to hear your, your take on it. So that's some, that's advice that people are commonly given, right? You got to delegate, you have to work on the business, not in the business. And, you know, it all makes such great sense, of course. But um, but my experience has been, my own personal experience is that it took this convergence of things to happen. And my sort of um, just experience of the world with a lot of entrepreneurs is that they get it, but they don't get it. They, they don't know how to even begin to think about delegating. Or they'll try it, for example, and they'll say, hey, Johnny or Susie, do this for me. And when they don't do it the way that 
the entrepreneur th thinks it should be done, they get frustrated and say, it's easier for me to do it myself. And I think that's why that's so delegation, what you is, is one of the biggest an inability to delegate or understand what delegation means, I think is one of the biggest things that makes entrepreneurs quit before they've, they've achieved what they're capable of achieving because they get tired and then they get lazy. They, they get tired and then they get lazy. They don't want to, they don't want the pain anymore and they don't want to suffer anymore. And they figure if I can just hold it together, that's my future. So that's a, a sorry for such a long thing, but I just want to, I just, I'm, I'm really interested in what, I'm really interested in this delegation thing. You're right. I mean, I know a lot of business brokers and they say, man, Philip, you know, you'd be surprised how many companies come to us and they're just ready to sell. They don't have three months. They don't have six months. They certainly don't have a year. Uh, they, they just come and, uh, and they're just exasperated and they just want to sell and get out. And it's such a shame. I mean, the, what you can do in three to six months with a company is incredible. What you can do in two years is, is absolutely transformative. And, um, you know, you, you, that's the power of, system and a model and tools is, is that it, you know, the right structure and a leader needs structure around them to become a great leader. They need, they need structure. They need a context, they need system. And so very simply um, you've got to have the right people. Um, you've got to have the right people before you can delegate. I mean, in EOS, we call it uh, the right people in the right seats. So they, they've got to, and we, we, we get very specific on what it means to have the right people and what that means uniquely for your organization. And we teach some tools that allow you to very definitively understand if somebody is the right person in the right seat. Um, but you need the right people first. And then you need some structure for those people so that you can delegate. Those people need to be, I mean, I'll just get really specific with you. Those people need to be reporting on their numbers every week. They need to be reporting on their quarterly priorities. Are they on track or off track? They need to know how to identify issues and solve those issues as a team. And so there are certain things that you have to put in place. And when you start to put these things in place, it kind of creates this natural vacuum and it facilitates delegation. And um, so EOS is a, is a tool for delegating. It is a method, a step-by-step -step method that will lead to just, will, you know, lead to the probability that you will finally be able to let go of the vine. You'll finally get to a point where you're comfortable enough to start letting go of the vine. And that's what it's built for. Hmm. And, w and in your experience, why is delegation important, not just for the leader or the entrepreneur, but why is it important for the organization? Like why, why do you need it? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it has to do with scale. But if you think about it, right, I mean, it makes sense that it would be hard, uh, especially for a founder, a true visionary, right? They, they, they created a product or a service and they, they had that vision and they took it to market. They got some people to buy it. They built up some co a company around it. And when the company gets to a certain size, right, all of a sudden, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. And you have all these people and process issues and communication issues and teamwork becomes an issue that happens at about 10 people. And so the, you can no longer be, uh, you know, you reach a point where you can't be the genius with a thousand helpers. You can't. I mean, and, and so when you reach that point, depending on where you want to go and how fast you want to get there, you've got to have the help of people with, with various and different specialties all working together, right? Working together to achieve a common objective. And that you, it requires teams. I mean, teams is what, is what achieves vision, right? Hmm. And you mentioned um, the business owners who come to business brokers and they're just like, I just have to get out of this. I got to get rid of it. I got to sell it. And you said three to six months or two years is a long time. It's certainly enough time to to improve a business um, markedly. So in your experience, again, you, you, you know, you're helping all different types of companies here as a coach, as an EOS implementer. What what are you seeing are the most common things that are missing 
or what are the most common disconnects that you and 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 EOS help fuse back together so that there's there is a future that's bigger than the past cuz when you want to sell right away you're running away from the past right you're 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 not thinking about what the future could be like it's just going to be like the past it's like looking in a mirror i suppose but when you fuse it together they get tired they get tired i mean i you know um they get tired they get exasperated they've been running around wearing all these different hats and i mean one of the you know the one of the key tools that um is is you know one of the key tools of leadership is building a cohesive and functional team okay especially across uh you know across the major basic functions of an organization across across different disciplines how do you get sales and marketing and operations and finance all work really well together those are very different disciplines very different perspectives and they each have their own objectives down in their departments and and how do you get them to work together as a team um and put their you know you said work on the business so put their business you know put the company hat on what's the common good for this company and it's not just sales and marketing it's not just operations it's not just finance it's a combination of all of those so how do you get just 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 getting a, a team together the way we do it is we get them together once a, once a week um, for for 90 minutes and they come together as a team and they review, review the most important numbers and priorities um, they you know and 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 solve issues and that's that we that's that's kind of the the one of the foundations that we establish it's called a, a meeting cadence and that's the weekly meeting cadence there's a different meeting cadence quarterly and then there's a different meeting cadence annually and one of the things i'm doing is helping entrepreneurs build create this meeting cadence and implement it at every level of their organization and so what you can achieve in that three to you know what you can achieve in three months is you can build a pretty pretty damn healthy weekly meeting cadence what you can achieve in a couple of quarters is you can learn that quarterly cadence. And after a couple of years, you've learned that week, that, that annual cadence. And there's different aspects of what you can predict and what you can achieve and the problems, types of problems you can solve depending on that length of time. Hmm. And what are, so what are the, some success stories? I mean, how do you, how have you, how have you, you know, helped people that were like me or the people that you describe in this quote, how, how have you helped them get their life back in the, and their business back in the right direction? Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I was sitting with a leadership team recently and, um, you know, they were well along their journey. They, they had really, restructured the leadership team, had a lot of really strong leaders as part of that team. Um, they, the visionary had put the integrator in, that's, that's what we call the, the COO, um, the, you know, the operations this guy. Um, uh, they had implemented a lot of these systems and tools. And um, what well, was funny, you know, the, the visionary was still having a hard time letting go. You know, he, mm -hmm. he, he was still very fresh for him and he, he knew how to do all the different things that kind of needed to get done down in the business. And so when he, when you know that and you have that history, you, it's easy for you to get pulled down in the business. That's kind of what you want to do. That's what you know. So you go, you go back to what you know. Well, they went through a merger and acquisition um, and it took long enough for him uh, it was several, it was a, was really a three or four month process. And, and he went through this M&A and it required a lot of his time. And when he, when it was done and over and he came back to the business, he had broken himself out of that routine of going down into the business and he, and, and the business had changed. And now some of his people knew some things that he didn't know. They had implemented some new processes, some new technology, that some things had happened and changed. And that was his breakthrough moment. Uh -huh. He had let, he had let go and, and it actually took, it took not just implementing all of these systems, but it took him going away for a little bit and then coming back. That's a great point because the, the, here's what I see so many people do. And this was me too. You, 
and see if this resonates with with you and the people you're seeing. So you you desperately don't want anything to go wrong. And so you feel like if you're there, the likelihood of something going wrong is 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 minimized because it will come to you before it goes wrong. The the problem or one of the problems with that thinking is you don't actually know what's going right and what's going wrong. And you don't know what your team is capable of. So the best way, like you just said, the best way, if you want to really know how what your company is like, go, go away, do something like that. Go away for two weeks and see what happens and don't do anything. And then when you come back, you can basically look at everything with a more objective eye and go, okay, here is here are the issues, right? Well, Mike, too, that, so this is what's really interesting. It, it, this is what my quote is a little bit about. Wanting nothing to go wrong can also be a rationalization. That can be, right, the leader rationalizing his behavior. What he really wants is you to do it exactly the way he's done it in the past or exactly the way he thinks it ought to be done. And, he, and what he or she can do is rationalize that by saying, well, I care about the end result. And, um, and so, so what you want to do is you want to find the right people and then trust them that they're going to get it done for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what delegation is. That's true delegation is you, the person knows the end result. The person knows where you're all trying to get to, and they're going to figure out how to get it done. And you got to be able to let them fail because failure is a part of growth. Failure is a part of learning. And of course, if you're holding the reins real tightly, you know, I call it the vine and I've been calling it the vine or the range. If you're holding the reins real tightly, you don't let people do that. You don't let them try their own thing. You don't let them fail. And that's a missed opportunity too. Right. So you really got to, you really got to, you got to get to that point. And it, it's a hard point and it's a major breakthrough. It's one of the many, there's a handful of breakthrough moments. And the one we're talking about is one of those. And, and that's what I live for. I mean, I just, that moment has to, all the pieces kind of have to be in place and you can only move as fast as, 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 you know, as the leader and the leadership team and the company can go. Um, I mean, you can, I can nudge them a little bit and challenge them here and there. And, but you have to, you look for that moment and then it happens and it's pretty cool. Well, that's a, that's an awesome place to end this. Philip, thank you so much for being on the show today. I've just been a blast getting to know you and, and, you know, sharing your entrepreneurial stories, your fifth generation uh, family business stories, and then this 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 coaching passion of yours has been it's been it's been a real joy for me to 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 learn and and absorb some of this stuff. And and for everybody listening, I'm sure um, they feel the same way because this is this is like the rubber hitting the road. Like if you want to be successful in business, you don't have to have the next greatest idea. You just have to. You just have to execute on a vision, build a team, hold them accountable, do the right things, and keep moving forward, and you will be successful, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, a big that's all right. A big part of it is 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 uh, is executing well. That's right. So, how do people you want get a hold of you if they want to if they want to connect with you? Um, what do they do? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Give me a call. I mean, uh, you know, you, you can find me at experiencetraction.com, and, uh, uh, but you can also give me a call at 323-377-7975. And I love, to, I love talking to entrepreneurs and would love to, love to hear about, uh, you know, your business. And, uh, and you can find my contact details on my website. It's experiencetraction.com. All right, Philip, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the How Did Happen podcast, where we believe that success doesn't happen unless you make it happen. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. And while you're there, please rate it and leave a comment as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the show, ideas for future guests, or whatever you'd like to share. And of course, you can always find me at MikeMalatesta.com. See you next time. Thanks again for listening to the How Did Happen podcast.